Welcome back to the Maritime CEO Leader Series powered by Ocean Technologies Group. For the next six weeks, we will be bringing you a mini series focused exclusively on seafarers, kindly sponsored by our friends at Wallen Group. Now, it goes without saying that the single largest volume of coronavirus linked stories we've written about at Splash this year has been on the crew change crisis. We've tried to track the story from every angle possible on a daily, unflinching basis. While it's heartening to see the volume of flights in and out of places such as Doha on the increase, there is still way too much hot air and red tape standing in the way of getting crews to their required destination. It is, and let's not beat around the bush about this, a humanitarian crisis at sea, the likes of which we have never experienced. So joining us today in the uh, inaugural episode of this mini-series are the heads of three maritime charities who have all been very active and vocal about the situation in recent months. Now, if I may, I'd like to start with you, Andrew, uh, with your key takeaways from what you've learned over the last four months or so. Thanks very much, Sam. Yes, there, well, I, there are so many takeaways, I think, for us at the Mission to Seafarers. I mean, obviously, I'm sure I share with my colleagues here, uh, and just picking up on what you've said there, the, the enormous issues over transit. I think all three of us would applaud the shipping industry. I mean, so much has been done by so many to push this thing forward. And the problems really have lain remain at governmental level. You know, one or two have said to me, well, of course, you know, seafarers on board ships, even if they've had to work beyond their contracts, it's a pretty safe environment and, you know, they're still being paid. But the reality is, and this came home very strongly from our happiness index results, which are due to be published very shortly, there's an enormous amount of stress on board ship. You know, I don't think we can underplay the impact, that uncertainty, uh, and, you know, will the crew change be successful or not, uh, and the impact on on those seafarers and, and their families about whom they are extremely anxious. And certainly in the happiness index, we've seen the stress levels growing there. And clearly very difficult to get a number around. It seems that it may be 200, 225,000, somewhere around that who are still at sea. And I think there is working beyond their contracts. And I think another forgotten area of this, which is really important, that similar numbers, of course, have been unable to join ships. And when you combine that with those who uh, have lost work from the cruise sector particularly, that is an awful lot of people at home with serious financial problems looming or already real. And I think that is a slightly forgotten aspect of this issue, which is also important. So clearly, um, in admission to seafarers, you know, we've been able to continue elements of our face-to-face -face work. A lot of our port operations have come under significant pressure, but we have been able to um, uh, continue some of our face-to-face -face work and Again, the whole issue of um, shore leave being denied and access to normal welfare facilities in ports or even local shops and so on has been very, very limited, even those where shore leave is possible. That has also combined with, uh, to have a big impact on seafarers. That face-to-face -face work has continued to be important, although we've only been able to do it at the gangway in a distanced way, combined with some supply delivery and sometimes obtaining medical goods for seafarers and so on, which has been important. And then, of course, there's been our whole uh, move into digital working uh, as a further way of building our ability to respond to this seafarer crisis. So the whole area clearly had a big impact on, on them and a big impact on us and our ability to respond. Catherine, we, uh, we've covered some of the um, releases that we've got from you uh, in the past few weeks. And there was one that uh, was pretty shocking about how there appears to be no official tally for suicide. Mm -hmm which is just an incredible thing. Uh, that's one of the takeaways I would imagine that you've sort of had over the past few months. Tell me about, you know, what, what it's been like uh, for you in the last few months. Um, Seafarers UK is um, a charity that gives grants to other delivery charities. So we work with delivery partners such as Ice One and Mission to Seafarers. So I think we have been really busy making sure that we've got enough money to give out to our partners to ensure that they can do great work. So Seafarers UK released £2 million from their reserves and in fact across the Maritime Charity Group, Maritime Charities, you've seen um, an extra £6 million in funds being made available. Uh, so I think really the, the takeaway for me is that the charity sector that supports our maritime industries and supports our seafarers has worked incredibly quickly and fast and innovatively to find some of the solutions to the problems. But of course, most of the problems that we, we're coming across, as you've said, are these crew changes and 
the number of people that are stuck at sea. And of course, what comes with that is an increased risk of suicide. Um, so we know that being at sea is an increased risk of suicide anyway because of isolation. But of course, the situation at the moment, which I think you absolutely rightly described as a humanitarian crisis, has shown that we really need to have a better idea of how many deaths at sea are actually suicide. Not only so we get a clearer picture, but so that our colleagues across the maritime charity sector can provide services which might prevent these suicides. So, yeah, there isn't a clear picture on the number of suicides. And, and I recognise that for families, that's often a positive thing, because many families will, will not want their insurance to be stopped because a death might be categorised as a suicide. And there are also cultural reasons for suicide being um, not something you want recorded. But the truth is that without having suicide properly recognised and recorded, we can't really tell the extent of the issue and encourage um, shipping and charities to be able to provide um, essential services to our seafarers. Roger, let's let's uh, turn to you now, if uh, we may, and uh, get your sort of take on uh, what's well, been a very frenzied four months, I imagine. Yes, I mean, I mean, we run Seafarer Help, the 24 hour helpline for seafarers, and we've received sort of triple the number of calls on that helpline since since the pandemic started. And uh, to really just to you know support what what both Catherine and Andrew have said, uh, you know, everyone's been working together, and I think one of the takeaways is the way we can work together uh, across the industry. That you know, the employers, ship ownership managers. Uh, the unions, uh, welfare organisations uh, and, and others. We've all come together, Catherine said, really quickly and also a credit to the funders to come up with uh, significant amounts of, of funding. We're very grateful for that. I, I think for me, what, what one of the key takeaways is, is the fact, you know, we need to do a hell of a lot more to get shipping recognised as a key industry. I mean, you know, I've been involved about 11, 12 years and I've always said, and a lot of us have said, it's a hidden industry. Seafarers live hidden life, and we need to do a, a lot more to to promote the industry and the and the key role it plays in, in the world's trade. I mean, we all we all know we all talk to each other. We know about shipping, you know, moving, you know, ninety percent of the world's trade. But I don't think, you know, not just the general public, but I think governments don't recognise this. And this has been seen. I think the fact that governments haven't really stepped up and and you know, haven't really gone out of the way to, to help repatriate seafarers. And, you know, I think individual embassies around the world, individual officials have been really helpful. But I think governments need to recognise the, the key role of, of, of shipping. I think the other thing as well, I mean, touches on what, what Catherine has said and, and Andrew, I think for me, one of the key takeaways is, is the importance of giving support to the mental well-being of seafarers all around the world. I mean, you know, a number of us, you know, we've been working for years on this, but it, it is an issue that's come to the fore, you know, as Catherine said, the issue about suicides at sea, but also the various surveys that have been done by Yale University and, and by Cardiff University. But, you know, the, there is work being done. We're, we're doing work, Mission Seafarers and a number of other organisations, and also to, a lot of shipping companies recognise now the importance of supporting the mental well-being of seafarers. But we, we know, you know, at the moment, seafarers are, are mentally and physically exhausted. The, the contracts are being extended. And we need to do um, a lot more. And it, it's more than just having a helpline or a training course. It's changing the culture in the shipping companies to recognise that this is the key issue. Roger, I'm going to stick with you. As COVID recedes, what actual concrete measures would you like to see come into place so that this debacle doesn't happen again? Well, I, I mean, to be fair, none of us, I don't think any of us saw this coming. So I, 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 th I think the, the industry, along with a lot of other industries, uh, had to kind of scramble to get a response. I think one of the things, given one, one of the key issues at the moment is the financial hardship for seafarers. And uh, it's not an easy one, and it may be a bit of an idealistic dream, but, but to give seafarers a bit more financial stability in, in their jobs. The ordinary seafarers on these voyage contracts don't know after... They leave a ship, leave their contract, where the next job's coming from. We, we know a lot of these seafarers from the Philippines and India, for instance, they have large extended families dependent upon them. It's not an easy one, but I, I, I think going forward, it's about giving seafarers uh, a bit more financial stability, a bit more certainty around, around their employment status, that it's not just 
you know, six or seven months and then finding another job. Uh, Catherine, is that that's probably makes sense to you? Is there anything else that you would like to see? Um, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with with Roger. Of course, we want to see much more um, security for our seafarers. Um, we want them to be paid better. I, I think the other thing that would be really useful that we've seen is that one of the things that's causing a problem at the moment is for visa waivers to be introduced. So I think we have the problem with crew changes is uh, intensified and exacerbated um, through COVID, and it's obviously uh, a vast number, an unacceptable number of seafarers stuck at sea. But some of the challenges that these seafarers face uh, are things that they would face anyway, but we're seeing it on a grand, grand scale. So I think it's highlighted that governments need to work together much better. Uh, and we also need the flag states to also take more responsibility for how seafarers are treated in terms of these crew track changes. Now, Andrew, same question, yep. but I'll give you a slight kind of a skew on the question, as well as, you know, the changes that you might like to see. Be honest, how likely is it, this is shipping, that we will see changes? That's a very interesting take on I'm just going to rattle through one or two things very quickly, and then I'll come to that. Um, uh, obviously, the, the whole business of recognition of seafarers as essential workers. I mean, it's been points been made many times during this pandemic. The contrast between the way they're treated and the way average airlines staff are treated has been marked. And I think that makes the point very clearly. Secondly, I think it's really important, and we've been working on this, that um, maritime welfare workers are regarded as essential as well, because seafarers have really needed support at this time and in many parts of the world we and our colleagues have been able to get access to ports or ships, even in the case of quite severe circumstances. That's been a major issue. I'd also highlight the problem of comms. One of the things that's come through our happiness index is that families have been really have really lacked information coming from shipping companies and management companies about what's happening um, to their spouses. Um, and again, you know, during piracy, when that kicks in, you know, they're often very clear systems and family are very closely liaised with. Um, often families have felt really, really in the dark during this crisis, and that might well be an area which could be improved. And I highlight too, you know, a lot of them have had shore leave cancelled if they haven't got access to Wi-Fi on board ship or in the port, which is quite often the case still. That really, really is a strain on, on them and their families. And, you know, the provision of Wi-Fi on ships and in ports at a good speed and at reasonable or zero prices is so important. And I think that is a, a vital takeaway. And I would just back up the issue that um, that Rogers raised there about resilience. You know, the, the fact is the great that we've seen increased numbers of programs. And it's, as Roger said, he's been working on this. We've been working on this. And I know many shipping companies are working on this. But out at sea, to be able to look after your own mental health and be able to look after the well-being of your colleagues and recognize, for example, signs when someone may be feeling suicidal, that is crucial. And I absolutely think that's got to be a key plank for all of us going forward in terms of preparing crew to meet these unusual circumstances. And it has been interesting that it seems to be in the crew sector that we've seen a higher number of suicides. And it may be that many of the crew in that sector are less well prepared, perhaps, than, than crews on other ships. Whether we'll see lasting change, yes, it is my concern that, you know, in the middle of a crisis, a lot is said and a lot of promise. A seafarer has come to the Mind. Certainly, we're experiencing, and I'm sure Roger and Catherine would, would repeat, would acknowledge this as well. We've had far more media inquiries than we've ever had, probably possibly in the history of the mission to seafarers, and that's been great. You know, seafarers are on a lot of people's agendas, and and you know, a lot of great conversations around what we can do for them. My fear is that memory lasts a very short time; people move on rather quickly. So I think, you know, I think that the three of us and many others will be working very hard to try and keep these things high on the agenda. And certainly our own charities will be focused on trying to take these things forward. And then I think there's this whole issue, finally, of digital support for seafarers, which has played such a crucial part. Um, you know, the helplines at, the, at Ice One and so on and our own chapter chaplain service and others that, that the people are doing. These have been crucial. And I'm sure that the vital thing for the future is to build on these experiences and provide really good digital support, as well as face-to-face -face support for seafarers. And I very much hope that happens. Thank you, everyone, for a great first installment of the Wallum sponsored Maritime CEO Seafarer Leader Series. Do go to our dedicated Seafarers page to keep up to speed with all the latest 
crew news. We'll be back next Thursday. In the meantime, everyone stay sane and sanitized.